Again, welcome to our show, Indian Time. This month is uh, month of June. Is Khoyalis Pakanis. As I said before, this is Khoyali uh, means the the camas, raw camas, and um, it's a three-day process to cook the camas. And uh, our elders of the past had it had that down to perfection, so every time they cooked camas in the three days, uh, it came out perfect. You cooked it in a pit, and uh, there's a process that you utilize uh, uh, different material uh, rocks that you, you heat and it falls in, and you use water to steam. There's uh, alder bushes, alder branches, alder leaves, then you have skunk cabbage. Um, the black tree moss is is mixed with the uh, uh, with the camas. The black tree moss is called shautumkan, and one, one, after it's cooked, then it's called skodla. So it changes after the, the process. Um, June is also a time that we went out and get tipi poles because they're easy to peel this time of the year. Um, our ancestors used to watch for different signs, different animals uh, to know what's going on. Um, they would watch the, the change or the blossom of different plants and they knew this was going on at that time when, when those uh, plants blossomed. Um, it was also the time uh, of pick, getting ready to go out and, and pick berries uh, to go. Uh, so they would go out and, and start getting ready to uh, get some barks, make bark baskets. Uh, there was a lot of preparation this time, getting ready for the long summer season, uh, preparing uh, for this, the winter months, and it seems like that's all it was for our ancestors at that time, was a, a preparation uh, uh, year-round. Um, the celebrations in July was when uh, the elders or the ancestors took a break and they, before they went on to the next, uh, next step, I guess, in pre preparation for the winter months. Also, in, in, as I said earlier, the, in 1872, Congress authorized funds for the Salish removal from the Bitterroot, and uh, the Congress appointed James Garfield to go to the Bitterroot Valley uh, to negotiate an agreement uh, with Charlo and his people. Uh, Charlo, as we all know by now, refused to sign, uh, but yet his mark, his X mark uh, signature, uh, showed up on the document, and he uh, refused to, to move out of there, and it wasn't until about 10 years or 11 years later that he was f forcibly removed from the Bitterroot Valley. The, uh, um, also in, in 1883, on the 23rd of June, the railroad laid the, uh, their first rails for the Northern Pacific Railroad through the Flathead uh, Reservation. And it, it's uh, ironic that in 1883, the fight uh, not to allow the railroad through the reservation in 1883, uh, today in 2000 and 2001, the tribes were trying to resist uh, the expansion of the highway to four lanes instead of the, uh, the two super two. Uh, they see, it seems like the same process took place in 1883 for the railroad as it did, as it did today for the uh, highway. It's always a, a compromise on the, on the uh, side of the uh, Salish Pondere people, but uh, it's always a compromise that uh, we end up losing more and more. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about Korea. Uh, we never did, uh, last show, we, we didn't get a chance to really get through the program uh, with some of the things that Joe Cluya wanted to, to share with us. 
But before that, I'd like to remind people that the language camp at Blue Bay, hopefully at Blue Bay, will be June 18th through the 22nd. So I hope that if you plan on uh, coming to camp, that you plan on staying there, uh, camping up at Blue Bay, um, because there will be some activities also in the evening. We never had that opportunity uh, when we had camp at the, at the, um, um, at the Longhouse. And so we're trying to uh, move our, our camp back up to um, Blue Bay. So also uh, there will be a joint elders meeting at the complex um, coming up on the, uh, I think on Wednesday or Tuesday. Tuesday, so be ready for that, for the elders. There will be a joint elders meeting at the complex. Uh, I'm not quite sure where, but uh, if you have any questions, call me at the Longhouse at 745-4572 for more information. Uh, we'll, we'll get as much um, to you before then as, as we know more about it. Again, um, I'd like, as, uh, as a large show, the Korean War, like any other war, was, is, a, is an unpleasant experience for, for many people. Uh, war is uh, something that's been part of our lives, I guess, uh, from, from the time our ancestors first arrived here, trying to protect um, our values and our people. And today I have Joe Kluya again because we never finished uh, uh, on our first show. And uh, I, j I guess I just want to say that uh, we're going to continue from wherever Joe uh, wants to, to start again. And at the same time, we, we need to, to remember those of our veterans, our, our families who have uh, passed on because we just um, recently in Memorial Day honored all of our people. So with that, I think uh, I'll go ahead and let Joe go ahead and start uh, where he left off, uh, sharing his experience in the Korean War. And with that, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, when we, uh, when we were relieved from the Chorwan Valley, we moved west about three miles and we moved into Old Baldy area. That's where a lot of things happened. North Koreans and Chinese, they tried to break through. They were beat off every time. The North Koreans, they attacked us on a Last night of July, 1952, just about midnight, in the Old Baldy. Why they called Old Baldy? Because there's, when you get on any high ground, you can see that mountain. There's no grass, no trees, because it's been shot at so much. And when we were attacked that night, just right at midnight, and about an hour after the attack, that's when I was injured, I jumped on a iron fence post. I didn't know, because fighting was only about 400 yards from us. And I thought I got shot. Two of my friends came over and asked me, what does it matter? I told them, I don't know. Because no pain, no nothing. I didn't feel anything. I was almost paralyzed, it seems like. They would help me up. I'd take a few steps not to fall down. So when my two friends told me, said, well, we better take you back down, down to the truck, and we had to walk about a half a mile. 
When he'd walk on a trail and take about 15, 10, 15 steps, not fall down. I still didn't know what was the matter. These two guys had come back and had helped me up. I'd get up and I'd start walking and I'd fall down again. I didn't know what was wrong till next morning. That's when the medics started to work on me. The two medics had worked on me. They took care of me for a whole month. First 18 days of August, I was getting a penicillin shot every day. They were afraid of infection. After the 18th day, 18th shot, that's when they told me I was okay. But they kept me from going back to front line for another week. I was... So when they finally released me, I still wasn't feeling good. I was still very sick yet. But I went back on the line. And that's a rough job. So that's why we were try to be tough, I guess. Been up on the front line, you forget about everything. Getting shot at 24 hours a day. North Koreans, Chinese. There's always trying to break through our lines. Always busy watching for them. So it's really a, a job that you can't let your mind wander off. That's how come a lot of guys got killed because they were doing that. They forget about what they were there for. That's really sad when you try to keep these guys, keep their mind on a job. And he started daydreaming. They get killed for that. When we were attacked on Old Bali, was saying a while ago, two weeks, the Chinese and North Koreans, they tried to break through there, but they couldn't. So their casualties was about 1,200 that was killed on that hill. They'd go back and they'd be quiet for a while, for a few days, and they'd try again. While we were there, we were training South Koreans to be an artilleryman, infantryman, whatever, in engineers, medics, whatever. The, I helped train some of these South Koreans. And towards the end, before I came home, before the end of my tour, these South Koreans, they graduated. So their government made up a division of these new graduates. They come to 9th Rock Division, the South Koreans 9th Rock Division. And they put him on a hill, on a line, what they call a White Horse Mountain. A 
That's what his South Korean division was defending. And they were attacked by the North Koreans and the Chinese. North Koreans and the Chinese, they put two divisions. They were trying to break through there. In that 10 days of fighting, that hill changed, I think it's 24 times, changed hands. And we were right in the bottom of the hill, we were in reserves in case the Chinese, the North Koreans break through. And the South Koreans, they were about a half a mile above us, up on the ridge. On the last day of the fighting, when it stopped, the South Koreans were still there. And that, I guess we've done a good job of training these guys. Two divisions that North Koreans and Chinese suffered. And everybody was really happy for the South Korean division, just been just a few months old. That's why I'm really glad that I helped train these soldiers. I got one friend, his name is Pak Kwan Hee. He was a sergeant in the Korean army. And him and I become close friends. I got a picture of him. And I always got it close to my, my bed. Every now and then I get that picture out and looking at my friend. And that's what the war does, brings people together. The North Koreans, They round up all the civilians, those that can fight, and they send these guys up on the, on the line. They're not soldiers, they're farmers. I got a picture of one of the farmers that was dead, that's on the Old Baldy. because the North Koreans told them they had to fight for their country. And I guess they believed that. But they were really wasn't fighting for their country. They were just struggle of power between North and South. But the South Koreans, they were really good soldiers. I met a lot of them. They'd done everything to, to help us, and we'd done everything to help them, so it come out the way it's supposed to be. But I'm glad they were better than North Koreans. They're better trained than the North Koreans. And when it's quiet up on the front, very little shooting going on, they got to keep training. So that about three weeks was pretty quiet up on the on the line. So they pulled four artillery guns back about a couple of miles. It was just training. It's 155 Hausers. 
So I was up on the outpost that day, and this young lieutenant, he was looking for a target. There's nothing out there. Looked and looked and looked, couldn't find nothing to shoot at. So he seen to see a Korean or North Korean washing clothes in the river. He told us, says, I found a target. So when they were setting up the guns back there, when they were ready, they called in. The lieutenant was ready. So they gave him the direction of the target. We just put those four of us who was up on the outpost. Finally, the four shots. We heard the four shots. The lieutenant was watching, the guy was washing clothes. And all four rounds hit where he was squatted down the edge of the water washing clothes. When the smoke cleared away, he was gone. So that finished the practice for that day. So I don't know what happened, that guy needs laundry. Yeah, we stayed up there and take turns looking at binoculars, there was nothing. So that's some of the things that happened and all those different ways to train. No matter where you're at, you've got to be training. So that's what saves lives. And that's really uh, a lot of work, but it's good for the, every, each and every one of us. Joe, was there was there anybody else from here that the shoulder that you knew of? Well, I seen. Uh, I met uh, Joe Jingris. We moved out of Trowan Valley when we moved into Old Baldy. It was just kind of raining that day, so we was digging up. The outhouse was two trenches. I was digging one. The other guy was digging. And this guy kept talking, talking, talking. But he suddenly started getting on my nerve because I was trying to work, and there he was talking. I was trying to figure out how to, what to say to make him shut up. So I was digging this miserable because the rain had my poncho on, had my hood over my head, and he was the same way. Fine, I said, well, I'm going to ask him, see where he's from. So I asked him, where are you from? He says, we're in the Northwest. Whereabouts in the Northwest? Montana. Whereabouts in Montana? He says, Arley. And that's when I stopped, looked at him, he was digging. I asked him, what's your name? said, Joe Jingris. I told him, well, you're living just about a quarter mile from my house. <laughs> then he stopped. We started talking there. I forgot about him being on, getting on my nerve. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really happy to see him, and he was happy to see me. So we talked and talked after that. Then Vic left hand, he was pretty close to us all the time, but I never did see him. Well, all our work's done at night, so when we go on the front line, it all is working at night, so we, I had friends up there all that year I was there, 12 months I was there, and didn't get to hmm. know what they looked like. 
just go up there and pass by them and visit with them. My friends, I never get to see what they look like. If I see them in town, I would know where they are. Mm. So how, how long were you there? 12 months. 12 months. Beginning and the end of 1952. That's where I got to meet Dwight D. Eisenhower when he was elected president. He came over and it, he went all through the whole 155 mile MLR. Mm. Vi visited each and every division. That's where I got to meet him. Mm. And uh, Vice President Barkley, he was the Vice President Harry Truman, got to meet him. He delivered and presented the Presidential Unit Citation. And he was accompanied by uh, Francis Cardinal Spellman. So got to meet him too. Well, I'd like to thank you again, Joe, for sharing your experiences and your time in the Korean War with us. As uh, uh, I know it's difficult sometimes to go back and think about all the people and friends that you've lost. Uh, and I, I know it's, it's hard, and I just want to thank you for sharing your time. Um, as we all, you know, like I said earlier during the Korean War, there was uh, 142,000 U.S. troops lost there, and uh, all told, there was three and a half to four million people, including the civilians that were lost there. So with that, I would say, uh, and